shoes. Thank you. Be it. Well, thank you uh, to this lesson, worship. Appreciate that. Some people have musical capabilities. Some people like me do not. So I'm always thankful when the Biden Christ cleaned up. I never forgot about it. So Dallas alluded to the fact that uh, I'll be coming after you for a little bit. I almost hesitate to say because it has been a long time. The first time I spoke up here was 2003. So if you do the math on that, uh, what year were you born? 2003. <laughs> Why be cut enough here for a ball to on the shot? I'm really thankful uh, for the opportunity to come. There's a lot of environments here at U that you can be a part of. I've had the privilege through the years to speak in a number of different places, but there's something about this environment that really captures my heart. That's why I keep coming back candidly. I trusted Christ when I was in college. Um, I did grow up in a Christian home. See a little backstory. I uh, grew up in a very rough home environment, lots of dysfunction, lots of fighting. Lots of alcohol use. My brother, uh, who was adopted, he was seven years older. Uh, he started getting into cocaine, which just made a very violent childhood where I was getting beat up on a fairly regular basis. I did tell my brother, though, that I'm going to keep drinking milk. And one day, I'm going to hand it back to him tightly. That, that day came. But through the years, uh, we dealt with a lot of dysfunction. Long left when I was nine. Didn't really understand why. But I remember her saying to me, but I love you, and this is not your fault but I don't love your father anymore. And I'm never being very confused about that. Like, well, why'd you say it like that? What, what do you mean? It's not my fault. Is it my fault? You know, so just all of that, they end up just my dad, my brother and I, and they would fight off uh, until my brother got kicked out of the house. Uh, I learned this, uh, a young boy, that if you just stayed out of the fray, it's just safer in that way. Let them fight, just be a good kid. It's just easier. Uh, the problem is my anger towards my brother was growing. And uh, in fact, I, I couldn't remember walking up from elementary school, just knowing if I saw his truck, I was going to have to fight him. It's just, it's what it was. And uh, I finally said, you know what, forget, he's going to have to earn it. And something stacked in me and, and uh, released a rage that I uh, had never experienced before. I remember chasing with an hammer. And if he'd have fallen down, I'm fairly confident I would have killed him. I just hated him with the utmost of hatred. And, uh, what I realized, though, how in that is uh, it, it, if, you, if you get in a fight, like, at the lunch hour and you get suspended, but if you get the fight on the football field, you get a trophy. And so I just spent the next decade of my life gathering trophies. I just put all of my rage into athletics. And then off the field, without a mom in my life, uh, I, I just learned how to manipulate. And I share this because the, the two besetting sins that I still, to this day, as a 50-year-old man, are working with is uh, control and anger. And I'm thankful for the work of the gospel when I trusted Christ in college. Uh, if anyone is in Christ, when a creature's old things pass away, new things have come, and so I'm faithful not identified by those old things anymore, but to be candid, they're still very much present. I share that by way of backstory because my, um, my exposure to sexuality was very twisted. So my mom left my dad for another woman. So mom's been gay most of my life. My dad uh, and his response to that was, I'll show the hound. Or he thought him that I'm a real man. So there were women in and out of my home all, all the time. Uh, my dad remarried for about 13 months to a gal named Joanne. And my brother was having sex with one of her daughters. And so they divorced and she moved out. It was a very confusing sexuality. The and what I've learned is, uh, if you uh, talk nicely, if you're kind, then you could get what you want out of relationships. So I became a user for uh, an, a number of years, and it, it scarred my view of sexuality. I objectified women. Um, it was very physical. It was very manipulative. Looking back now with, with the gospel in my life and a, and a wee bit of maturity, I just realized I was trying to meet a need. I just needed to be loved. And I wasn't loved. I got abandoned by my own mother. And so uh, wanting to fill that void, I turned in a very unhealthy way to, uh, to uh, dating relationships, to sexuality. Uh, in, uh, after I graduated college, uh, I went to, uh, to give disciple, went through a discipleship program. Similar to this, it was, uh, it was awesome business. And I learned my Bible. And the guy who was discipling me taught me the Song of Solomon. And I had never heard anything like it. I had no idea that it was a design for sexuality. 
I had no idea that there was a way to handle the desires and feelings that I had, that the feelings weren't bad, but the, the acting out on them outside of the proper context not only were bad, but would be catastrophic. I was living in the ashes of my own bad decisions for years and years and years, and it just reset my view of sexuality. It's been an issue I've been passionate about uh, since trusting Christ, an issue passionate about because I knew I needed it because I was a wreck. And I also knew that I'm probably not alone, that there's other men and women who need to hear hope of a higher calling of what could be in Christ to handle these feelings and to deal with all of this. And so uh, when I first got invited to come up to Joshua, I taught Psalm of Solomon. And uh, when I got invited back, I said, hey, I could teach this or that. They're going to do Psalm of Solomon. And Dallas, in fact, gave me a bad time at one point. He goes, man, I'm just, do you know any other books of the Bible? Because Paul had ever heard you teach is Song of Solomon. And it just is so impactful to see God's design from the Word of God that one year I, I tried to teach the book of Colossians on a Monday night and the class revolted. And so Tuesday we went to solve the book and the song. We're going we're gonna to do Song of Solomon. But what I want to do because of the uniqueness of where we're at as a culture, I'd like to do something tonight that's a little bit more worldviewish. Uh, when we'll be at Genesis chapter 1 eventually, so if you have your Bibles, we'll get there. But I want to talk a little bit about the uniqueness of where we're at as a culture, as it relates to these issues of sexuality, because it's a very, very unique time. And truthfully, I've never seen anything like it in my lifetime. And uh, Dallas's mom is nodding. She's got some season of life behind her as well. It's unique. And look, if we don't speak to it, the problem is culture will. And uh, we will lose ground on how to reframe uh, sexuality in a way that honors the Lord. I will be candid with you. I will talk bluntly about issues. I'm not trying to be shock value. I'm really not trying to be provocative, okay? I'm not going to cuss as a way of like honoring a or anything like that. But I just want to talk as adults, if we can, about the issue. Because I think if, uh, if we can, then maybe we could reframe the way we think about it. Uh, to set us up, I'm, I'm thinking about 2 Corinthians 10. 3 through 5, where Paul says that no, we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are uh, divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, for we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. One of the challenges we have, we need to understand that this battle we're fighting is indeed a battle. And if you are not uh, committed to this battle and battling in a way that honors Christ and is in keeping with God's word, candidly, you've already lost. Because what's going to drive your thought process and what's going to drive your behavior is flesh, and the flesh is hostile to God. It's not able to please God. And so we've got to come back to realize there is a spiritual battle that, that we are fighting. And so what I want to do is just sort of walk through a worldview sort of... Um, summary of where we're at. And uh, in fact, you're going to be reading one of the books that is, uh, I've been thinking about a lot that's been shaping some of this content. And that is a book by Truman called A Strange New World. He wrote a book called The Rise and Fall of the Modern Self, which truthfully, like unless you have a PhD, it's really hard to stay with. And so he wrote in, and publishers never do this. He wrote a condensed version for simpletons uh, like us. And so it's called A Strange New World. And he built these books off of this idea of someone who made this statement that he felt like a woman trapped in a man's body. And he comments, uh, how, quote, um, how can this concept of, or this phrase or statement, I am a woman trapped in a man's body, how has that become coached or meaningful in today's society? Our grandfathers would have heard such a statement with blank incredulity, but now it's supposed to be taken take it very seriously indeed what's happened. That was the basis by which he wrote his book, I Am a Woman Trapped in a Man's Body. When we talk about the uniqueness of this current moment sexually, there's a uniqueness that we've never seen before, and that is the rise of this idea of gender, uh, what was gender disorder, not gender dysphoria, we'll get into it in great detail. And if you ask the question of how did we get here, where faithfully you're not on um, social media right now, but you can scroll through and see all kinds of awful. It was just a Grammy performance that happened the other South League. 
I have never seen anything like it, where the performer dressed up literally as Satan and had all of these transgender dancers around them. Uh, how do you even know the artist's name? Was it Travis Scott? Sam Smith. Sam Smith. And I was just like, I'm sorry, what is that? I knew it was like two first names I could forever with. I'm like, what is happening? And so we're, we're just at a very unique time. And what Truman has done is identified how we got here. So in a more brilliant way than I ever could, and so I'll let you just get the information from the book, talks to all of the thinkers of the past, the philosophers of the past that have led us to this place where we have uh, begun to lean into what he calls expressive individualism. I've never heard a concept that has resonated so clearly uh, than expressive individualism in this issue. So expressive individualism is the belief that your true identity is not found in any external force, any external characteristic, or any attribute, but it is found in yourself. So your true identity is found in you. And the chief goal of an individual is to find who they believe they are on the inside and then to express that in the world around them. So true self-actualization, according to Truman, is found not simply in recognizing one's individual identity, but in putting that identity on display. And in order then to be truly seen and truly heard, others need to not only see your true identity, but they need to affirm your true identity and celebrate it. To reject one's projected self is to reject them as individuals, thus devaluing them as individuals, dehumanizing them, causing them harm, and even denying their right to exist. Now on face value, that sounds completely ludicrous, but in the culture, that's exactly what's happening. So if, if someone is going to be affirmed in their community, they look inside, find what they think is their true self, and put that on display. It, it can be, candidly, as asinine as I identify as a furry creature. And so now I'm a furry creature. And for you to be accepted, or for you to accept me, is not only to tolerate the fact that I think I'm a furry creature, but to accept it and to celebrate it. And if you do anything less than that, that you are causing me harm. Now, on face value, that's nonsense, but that is the cultural moment that we are in. It also suggests that the highest moral authority in an individual life is found in themselves, not externally found in God, and therefore moral decency is a result of one's own desires, longings, and indulgences, meaning the barometer of what's acceptable or what is not is not a word from God externally, it's what I feel is appropriate. So if I feel like uh, indulgence with any, any one of, you know, of these you know, sets, then that's fine because that's what I feel. And so you are in no position of authority to tell me what's right or wrong. And so therefore, to speak against my desire of polygamous in, uh, indulgence, uh, to speak against that would be then to deny my right to exist. Are you with me on that? And so in that, there's no higher authority, no moral authority, no dictate by which we submit other than self. Now, this is influence for culture. We are living in this reality. This is not, please hear me. This is not like a pastor going, the sky is falling and the world's going to end. That if Jesus doesn't come back, this world's going to be crazy in 10 years. I'm saying, no, friends, this is already here. And you're probably familiar with language like this. How many of you have heard the, the, the uh, phrase, hey, you be you? Have you read that? Or maybe the phrase, hey, just be true to yourself. Or, um, hey, follow your heart. Or, hey, go find yourself. Or my favorite, because I hear it all the time, hey, you live your truth. Your truth. Your existence. Your experience. You live yours. I have mine. You have yours. That's expressive individualism. Being lived out in our culture. This frame of thinking has taken root already. And in many ways, culturally, it's a double move. It's a rejection of Judeo-Christian values. And in that, 
It's a move towards secularism, and it's impacting everything. And I want to just show you, if we can, four primary things by way of contrast of a secular view and a Christian or a biblical view. Okay, four primary cultural issues that this is influencing. Uh, and that is identity, sex, marriage, and gender. Okay, identity, sex, marriage, and gender. Let's talk about identity. The secular view says that human identity is self-determined, not God-determined. That you're my, you be anything you think you want to be. And so it's very individual. Uh, in fact, expressive individualism. It suggests a desire to pursue your own path and also a longing for others to affirm and celebrate. That's the secular view of identity that it's found uh, inside of you, not externally, and once you find it, you put it on display. The biblical view is that our identity is God-determined, not self-determined. We are who we are because we are fearfully and wonderfully made by our sovereign God. We are who we are because we have been uh, crucified with Christ, and so ever we who lives, it's Christ. And so our identity, from a biblical view, that is not self-determined, but God-determined. He is in that. He designs rather creation. He gives meaning to our life. He is the one who has the design. We were created with purpose, for a purpose, because God created us that way. Our identity is in Him. Uh, my dear friend, Biddy Burke, who's written, by the way, some great books, Transforming Homosexuality. He's got a new one coming out that would be worth checking out. Um, it's called Male and Female, He Created Them. Highly recommend you check it out. But he uses an, an analogy of a hammer. Like a hammer has a design. And when it's used according to its design, it's very satisfying. A hammer is designed to drive a nail. And when you hit a hammer on a nail and drive a thing, it's good at what it's designed to do. It can also get you into your car. Now, I don't recommend using it that way. That's not really what it's designed to do. And if you use it outside of its design, it's probably going to cause some damage because that's not it with what it was made to do. And interestingly enough, when it comes to this issue now of identity, our identity is found in our God. He created us to uh, live a certain way, to interact a certain way, to express our sexuality a certain way according to design. Now, we can use an outside of that just like you can use the hammer to get into your car, but it's certainly not recommended. Psalm uh, chapter 100, verse 3 says, uh, Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. But see, expressive individualism flips that on, on its head and says, no, we decide who we really are. Let's talk about the second issue, sex. The secular view of sex says that sex is for pleasure, not for God that it affirms any and all sexual expression as long as consent is present. We are seeing in our culture today, more than we've ever seen before, a movement of sexual perversion outside of God's design, shelving boundaries that before had been completely taboo. We have people redefining pedophilia to be um, youth attractive, and they're trying to normalize an adult male having sex or sodomizing a child and and give value to their desire to do so because that's who they think they are <laughs> and so we're, we're moving that way pretty significantly it means then that marriage and sex are not connected that, that you don't have any reason to get married to have sex you just have sex with whoever you want that monogamy and sex are not connected and the idea of abstinence you talk about abstinence and people will look at you like you have three heads. They will think you are crazy because we are driven now by this secular view. Instead, my desires and my feelings are so a part of who I am to deny the fulfillment of my desires uh, and expressions uh, would be in many ways to deny my very self. It's one of the reasons, by the way, pornography is so prevalent and masturbation is prevalent. It used to be that the fellas were looking at pornography and masturbating, and the ladies weren't. It used to be a little bit more uh, that the lust of, of the females were a little bit more uh, in their minds, fantasy. 
Uh, but those numbers are almost even now, male and female pornography and masturbation. Why? Because we've been driven by a secular view of sex that are good and are flourishing are defined by the interconnectedness and free expression of sexuality. That sexual freedom is a fundamental human right. That's the secular view. Uh, one of the things that's happening uh, based on this secular view is when some scholars are calling prolonged adolescence. It's an interesting book called Feeding the Mouth That Bites You. And the premise is uh, what he calls planned emancipation. It's a, basically a parental book raising teens to launch. And he makes the argument that adolescence is an unbiblical concept. And if you think about it, Paul says this, when I was a child, I used to think like a child and reason like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish states. As if it was like, done, I was, and now I'm a man. But boy, if you think about it now, uh, what is it that makes someone an adult? Well, it's the ability to live on their own, the ability to have a career, uh, the ability to make decisions without mom and dad doing your laundry, you know, et cetera. And yet now uh, we're prolonging adolescence to the point where we keep, we've got 30 year old men still playing Xbox at home in the basement. Mom's bringing food down and doing their laundry. And we've got a 30 year old boy. And so we've created this very strange prolonged adolescence and sex is a huge part of that. And now, interestingly enough, it's allowing for more sex, but not better sex, uh, more sex uh, that has come out of, uh, but it has come rather at an incredible cost. If you look at the divorce rate in and outside of the church, it's almost equal. So even those claiming to be Christian, claiming to be followers of Jesus, claiming to be disciples of Christ are still embracing now this secular view. So what's the biblical view of sex? Well, that it's God, it's a God honoring expression of his design that he created us as sexual beings. So if you feel, and we'll talk about this in the Song of Solomon, if you feel sexual desires, nothing wrong innately with the desires, God made you to have those desires. The question is, what do we do with those desires? So first Thessalonians chapter four, Paul says, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you learn how to possess your own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the heathen who don't know God. So the issue is not the desire, it's what we do with those desires. So the biblical view says it's a God-honoring expression of his design. And it's connected to Genesis, which we'll get to here in a little bit, as the expression of the one flesh union, Genesis 2.24. For this reason, a man will leave his mother and father, Genesis 2.24. He will uh, be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Worth noting, by the way, some people go, yeah, but that's old school. Yeah, but Jesus quoted that and Paul quoted that. Words for word in Ephesians 5 and uh, Jesus in the Gospels, Matthew, I can't remember which, but quotes that passage, point being, it's not simply something that we disregard. Well, going on, the biblical view also says that connected to procreation in Genesis 128, being fruitful and multiplying. It's an expression of love and a conjugal union. It's an ongoing expression of exclusivity of oneness. Uh, one of the things that you need to understand about sexuality is we are learning more and more that for uh, previous data, it used to be that the, the hookup culture made for better sets. And what they're finding now is that's actually not true because what happens is you don't know the person. So the transaction, and that's probably a good way to put it, the interaction is a transaction where uh, you get your needs met, the person gets their needs met, but there's no sense of oneness. So fast forward, I've been married 25 years, been married 25 years. The oneness that I have with my wife is different today than it was 25 years ago. And the difference is oneness. To be candid, it's, it's less about the physical connection and more about the spiritual oneness. Because a one flesh union, biblically, is it just we got into the backseat of the car and something happened and then we cleaned ourselves up? No, no. This is, this is a one flesh union meant now to show the, the, really the image of God, which we'll get to here in just a bit. All right, let's talk about marriage. So identity, sex, third one, marriage. That means then the secular view of marriage is that it's cultural, it's not universal or biblical or divine. It is simply cultural. It's an event. You go to a winter formal, you go to a prom, you throw a wedding, 
It's an event. That's all it is. Now, it's interesting because if you think about it like that, how many of you have been to weddings where the couple getting married has been living together for years? They've already joined bank accounts, right? There's really no reason to do the wedding other than the event itself. That, that's the secular view, which means it's, an, it's human to hit its origin. It's not divine, and it rejects divine revelation as it relates to marriage altogether, which means that divorce is the obvious outcome. We'll talk a little bit about attracting for the right reasons in Song of Solomon, but if your view of marriage is secular, then why would you stay married if you're fighting? Why not divorce? Why not go find an upgrade? And why not move on to something better? If that's your view of marriage. Also, by the way, if marriage is cultural, not universal, if there's no divine parameters on it, then why couldn't a woman marry a woman? Why couldn't a man marry a man? Because, by the way, if that's what they feel on the inside of love towards one another, shouldn't we affirm that? Well, if your view is that it's secular, then sure you should. But I, I want to show you maybe another way. It also means then that marriage uh, is a human right, not of divine origin. So who are we to say, we'll do this wedding, we won't do that. We'll bake a cake for this couple, but not for that couple. You could use the facilities if you're this kind of marriage, but not that kind of marriage. And that's exactly where we are today. Well, what's the biblical view? That marriage is biblical, it is not cultural that it's divine in its origin, it's not uh, created by society, which means it's part of God's unique design for humanity. So Genesis 1.28, God blesses his creation, male and female, says to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. And then in 2.24 speaks again, of a man leaving mother to father, flee joined to his wife. So very, very critical, the contrast with those. But let's deal with gender, and this is where I'd like to spend the majority of our time if we can. When it comes to the issue of gender, there's two views, right? The secular view says gender is a sign, it is not revealed. Gender is a sign. So what, what that suggests that is when you're born uh, with a vagina, the doctor goes, oh, well, we'll call you a girl. If you're born with a penis, he says, well, we'll call you a boy. Your male genitalia, by the way, showing what by way of DNA, your body created by God was already wired to demonstrate outside the rare, rare exception of intersex uh, births. And, and therefore, though, the circular view says, no, 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 that's not from God or any design. That's just, we're just going to say, well, so far, because of the parts, you're starting off as a boy or a girl. But um, it's a side to you. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's your actual identity. And so over time, it's a mystery. It's not clearly evident, and so we have to wait and see. And so uh, a boy at birth who was a sign that may become a, a girl, a girl may become a boy, because they feel that's who they are on the inside. Very difficult to determine a birth, so let's wait and see. So gender then is, a, is an assigned thing, but it's malleable. Uh, as the child matures, they become more aware of how they feel. Now the biblical view, of course, is that one's gender is connected to the biological sex. And so it's determined by God at birth. God made us, according to Genesis, male and female, according to his design. Now, the uniqueness of expressive individual, individualism on this transgender moment is it's almost like the language is purposely confusing. So, for example, you've got language like biological sex. Biological sex being determined by God. There's distinct bodily features. Distinct genitalia means bone structures are larger and more dense. Women tend to have wider hips to aid in childbirth. Obvious difference uh, regarding reproductive um, organs, etc. Uh, and reveals now the reality of the of the uh, the real sexual binary of male and female. It's also a chromosomal reality, male and female. So you, your DNA can determine whether you are male or female. We could dig up a fossil. Uh, from Israel and find a skeleton and know, was this person a male or was this person a female based on how God designed their bodies? But now we've got the addition of this term called gender. Now, the word gender uh, was really created in 1995. It was created by a guy named John Money. He was a key thinker of what's called the Kinsey Institute, which is an institute uh, that explores and observes sexuality, specifically in children. And he created this concept of gender, and he tried to separate biological sex 
from gender. And he said, no, no, gender is a, is a social construct of norms, behaviors and roles, etc. It is fluid. And, uh, and so he, he pushed on the idea of, of gender being uh, something that is uh, a given, but rather something assigned. And because it's assigned, it could be changed later as the person feel, figures out who they are. Now, with that then comes gender identity. And this is where it gets a little bit weird. So gender identity is how your gender begins to manifest itself to the world. And sometimes your gender identity is in sync with your biological sex, and sometimes things are a little bit off. And your mind and your body are a bit at war together. That's how we get the concept of I feel like a, uh, a woman, uh, attractive man's body. That's, that's where that comes from. Now, there's something called the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Who cares other than this? Before 2013, it was called Gender Identity Disorder. But if it's disorder, that assumes something's wrong. And so the activists came along and said, no, 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 it can't be a disorder. It, it needs to be something different. So they changed it in 2013 to gender dysphoria. And what that means is it's a mental distress. It's not a disorder. It's just something you feel uncomfortable with. And so uh, where, where does that lead us now? Well, I guess you've got cisgender and transgender. Cis is the Latin words we're along this side of, trans but the other side. But just a list of genders that are out there now, non-binary, intersex, gender queer, gender fluid, gender not conforming, gender expansive, agender, gender void, bigender, omnigender, pangender, two-spirit. I mean, it's never going to stop as long as people have the ability to find out who they think they are. And, and the arrogance of it is this. So for millennia, male and female has been sufficient until this moment. And in this moment right now, people are like, no, male is just too limited. I identify as such also. And so we can jump the fence of reality into these various gender expressions. Now, here lies the problem. And I know you just got back from the DR or super sleep, so I want to be mindful of time. But herein lies the problem. So you've got, in this case, if you've got gender dysphoria, a body identity problem where your mind thinks you're something and your body doesn't feel like it fits that. Well, there's another disorder called body identity integrity disorder. It's a real thing uh, where literally there are people who feel like they've got two legs, but they feel like they really should only have one. And, and they would feel whole if they could just get that leg removed. It's a real thing. And uh, unfortunately, what's happened is my faith, I guess. Physicians have said, well, I'm not going to cut off your full, like, fully good way. Your body is fine the way it is. I'm not going to allow your mind to, to then implicate me to enter into a surgery that would alter your body. The problem's not with your body, the problem's with your mind. Faithfully, they've done that. So there haven't been those surgeries to mutilate a body. Now, think about it this way. Uh, if you see someone who struggles with anorexia, if they could be as thin as thin can be, see themselves in a mirror, and they think they're fat. Well, what's the, what's the loving thing to do? To put them on a diet so that they think they're fat? Their mind is saying they're fat. It's a loving thing to do to embrace what their mind is saying and put them on the diet? No, that would cause them more harm, not good. The loving thing to do is say, hey, there's a disconnect between your mind and your body. Let's face your mind. Let's help deal with the mind. Let's help you get straight in your mind, and here's the problem as it relates to gender transition, is we have now young boys, young girls, predominantly, by the way, young girls. Uh, Abigail Schreier wrote a book called Irreversible Damage. It is phenomenal. And she's talking about what she calls the social contagion, specifically with girls, uh, where it has five years ago, probably five years ago, very few cases of gender transition uh, or gender dysphoria. And now it is absolutely through the roof and primarily driven by social media, right? Whether it's TikTok or Insta or Snap or whatever. But this idea of, hey, you don't feel good in your body? You feel a disconnect? Well, it's probably because you're a boy. Well, that's never been a category. By the way, what 13-year-old doesn't feel weird in their body? You know, boys are having erections. They're like, I don't know what's happening. This feels so weird. I got pimples everywhere. Something wrong. Yes, something wrong with you. You're a 13 year old boy. So just hang off. Okay, everything's going to work out. But what's happening is that I'm a 13 year old boy goes to school 
and says, something's wrong with Caleb. And the teacher says, well, it's probably because you're a girl. I've never thought about that. I've always played with girls' toys. It doesn't make you transgender. It means you played with girls' toys. Who cares? Right? And you play that out logically, and now what's happening is we're moving down to what they call gender-affirming care. We're moving down the road very, very quickly. This is a true story of what happened in our church. Uh, we've got a uh, staff person who has a child who at school said exactly what I just said to you. I feel a little weird. Like, I, f- I don't know, I just don't feel good in my old body. And the teacher said, well, it's probably because you're the other, another sex. I'm trying to stay vague so I don't rat out a staff person. And uh, they said, oh, it's probably because you, you need to be the other, the other sex. And they go, well, I never thought about that. And the teacher said, well, I'll tell you, if you lot it, we could just start calling you by those pronouns. The other pronouns, if you want. Yeah, if you want, you can come up with a new name. We'll call you by your new name. By the way, mom and dad have no clue. The teacher's not calling mom or dad. This is a true story. Not calling mom or dad. And so they get the emails to the kid uh, in a certain name, and any emails to home go with the given name. Uh, they refer to the kid with the preferred pronouns. Okay? And, and now the kid's saying, well, this, this feels different. Now the kid's getting some attention. The kid's getting not only seen, but affirmed and celebrated. Because expressive individualism is not just about you finding out who you are and putting it on display. It is now your obligation to find out what your identity is, what you want, what you think. And I'm supposed to not only tolerate, but affirm and celebrate whatever you want to be. Great, you and me a furry creature. I have a fur guy. I love furry creatures. Who doesn't love furry creatures? We're like, yeah, you're a furry creature. She says, yeah, but I want to be called Caesar. Great, Caesar, what's a furry creature? And if I don't celebrate it, then I'm canceled. I'm denying her rights. It's just, so that story goes on. The parents find out that the teacher did that. And so the parents call the teacher like, well, 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 how about patient waiting? How about that's my kid? How much, where are you going with this? That teacher calls CPS and says CPS, Child Protective Services, who you call when, when a kid is getting beat up, when, when a kid is not safe, call CPS. CPS goes to the house of my staff member and says, hey, we're concerned that you're not creating a safe environment for your child. That's where we are today. What's gender affirming care look like? It starts with the affirmation where you're embracing attention with their mind and body. It's going to go to preferred pronouns. Uh, it's going to also then go to a name change, most likely. Uh, next step is hormone treatment. Just talked to a couple yesterday at church. They said, hey, I need your help. with the what's up? They will our daughter. She our son. Our son, who's 19, decided he wanted to be a woman. He just started taking estrogen. So this went down yesterday. And so it starts with hormone blockers, basically, puberty blockers, or hormone treatment. Here's the lie that the media is saying, and what the activists will say, that it's a temporary block on puberty. I just play that out mentally for a minute, just logically. So you're a 13-year-old boy, and you're going from fruit puberty, and you take medications to block that. Now you're taking estrogen. And then sometime down the road, you go, ah, you know what? I changed my mind. Have you just paused it, and then back at 13, does it key back up with you? Or you just lost gears and completely jacked yourself hormonally, that you will never be the same. I mean, these kids will literally never be the same. And then the file, of course, is uh, surgeries, top or bottom surgeries, double mastectomies, chemical castrations, vagioplasties, phalloplasties, where they're creating fake penises, fake vaginas, with skin grafts. And, and this is hap- here's the thing. This is happening now. And you've probably, I would imagine, in your season of life, you've at least seen this with some of your friends at this point, or at least heard about it more in more proximity than even, you know, your parents or grandparents, to be sure. Now, why why do I share all of that with you? Uh, Because unfortunately, what happens then is this moment pushes you to a, uh, what I would call a binary decision. And that is this, Uh, there's either the intolerance option or the tolerance option. The intolerance option says, look, if you oppose transgenderism, if you oppose homosexuality, if you refuse to to embrace somebody's fantasy and use their preferred pronouns, they don't get preferred adjectives, so why would you give them preferred pronouns? 
if you refuse sexual indulgence, if you are, uh, if you are not simply uh, opposing sexual expression, you're opposing Shem as a person, and they will cancel you. You just, you just deny the right to exist, and they will call you a bigot. They will call you phobic. Uh, you've violated their civil rights, and so you now are canceled. The other option, because nobody wants to be bigot, is the tolerance option, where the only way to show love and compassion is to recognize all sexual expression is morally acceptable and worthy of affirmation, even celebration. So we just go to the accepting side. And unfortunately, Christians say, well, we just go to the accepting side because Jesus was love. Jesus went and embraced this changed shepherd movement and loved people. I, Tyler, Tyler, I think you're making an apple an intellectual jump because you're, you're dealing with what I'm call a false binary. There's a third option. And the third option is a biblical option. And the biblical option is this, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 and following, says we should no longer be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by trickery of men or craftiness of deceit, by scheming, but speaking the truth and the love, we are to grow up in all aspects, and to him was the head of the Christ. First uh, Corinthians thirteen six says, Love rejoices in truth. And Isaiah five twenty says, Woe to those who call evil good and good. The third option is this is say, look at it's not about intolerance, because I could love somebody who's in the transgender movement. I can love them without universal acceptance. Okay. I can love someone without having to um, affirm their lifestyle, and I can invite us back into God's design, back to what God says, back to the real use of the hand, and that is striking a gal. By way of uh, time, uh, what I'd like to do is just turn quickly to Genesis 1, spend a couple minutes here, and then we'll wrap up for the evening. Genesis chapter 1, I just want to show you the hammer. I'm going to show you what God created, why he created it, and I'll set the stage for where we're to are. Genesis chapter 1, a real quick summary. Have you studied Genesis, by the way? Yes. Okay, good. Pound and We did no test. Perfect. I'm going to very, well, good. <laughs> But I'm very, very quick. To turn, to, turn to Genesis 126. I'll just make a few highlights based on, on the fact that you've studied this already. Worth noting, verse 26 of Genesis 1, the us, make man in our image. Uh, it doesn't teach Trinity, but it sure does allow for it, which I think is fantastic. Uh, Canon R. Michaelis, uh, he, he creates them. And if you look at 27, uh, God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blesses them. Notice in God's design, it's male and female that together reflect the image of God. One of the things we'll see as we walk through Song of Solomon is there are unique skill sets and traits that you have as fellas. And by the way, I hope you grow up to be men. I hope you grow up to be masculine. And by the way, that's not toxic masculinity. It's just dudes who can be dudes. Dudes who can fight if necessary. Dudes who can carry wood if they have to. Of dudes, if when push comes to shove, are capable of all kinds of lawful if they have to. And by the way, ladies, I hope that you grow up to be women. Women who, yes, fake their arms strong like Proverbs 31, yes, like Ruth can glean in the fields, but also aren't afraid to be fragile and delicate and tender. That's the beauty of God's design, because together we reflect the full image of our God. All right? And then you'll notice. He, uh, he blesses them and says to them, be fruitful and multiply. Part of God's design is the possibility of procreation, the assumption of consummation and the possibility of procreation. The reason I think possibility, not every uh, guy can have kids, not every gal can have kids. Kids aren't like the end all be all. They are a gift from the Lord. But the concept is men with men, as Romans 1 would say, uh, he is unnatural. Women with women, unnatural. Uh, but instead, it's men and women together in a monogamous relationship. Fast forward to chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. God gives them freedom to eat from any tree in the garden, and then comes out the fall, which is in chapter 3. And in chapter 3, what I want to identify here is really the root issue of sin that drives this whole process. God tells Adam in 2.17 the fruit of the tree that he can eat and the what he can't. He passes that all to Eve, probably poorly, because the chapter three server comes for her. 
And in that, God's going to challenge, or see, brother, will challenge three things of God, his justice, his word, his justice, and his love. And in verse uh, 6 of chapter 3, Eve now sees that the tree is good for food. It's a delight to the eyes, desirable to make her wise. She takes it and she eats. One of the greatest summary words for what happened right here is called autonomy. And what autonomy means is instead of obeying God and living according to his design, I choose for myself what I want to do apart from God. That's sin. If the ultimate root of sin is autonomy, a rejection of God, or pursuing of self, and if we come all the way back to the very beginning, if you look at the essence of expressive individualism, it is autonomy. It is self, it is flesh, it is sin. And so the challenge as we talk about this issue, just by way of worldview, is there's going to be a lot of voices that are whispering in your ear, a lot of directions you could go. The question I would have for you is, uh, which path will you take? Because in some ways you could give it a hammer. And that hammer is your biological sex. And that hammer are the feelings that are inside. And that hammer is what your mind thinks. And that hammer is this issue of sexuality and how to live it out. And you've got two choices. You could use it according to God's design, and it's very sad. Or you could use it to break into your car. And it's catastrophic. And unfortunately, what we are being told uh, by those who don't know God is that way's better. And I just want to push on that and say, honestly, I think you're full of garbage. It's not better. In fact, it leads to nowhere but shame with regret. When Jesus says, I've come that they may have life and have it abundant, the abundant life is found in keeping with God's word. Though the world says indulge, I say, I'll show you a better way. A way that is in keeping with God's desire to truthfully is more life-giving. That's what we'll get into uh, here tomorrow. We're going to cover uh, tomorrow uh, the issue of attraction. Uh, then we'll cover Wednesday, uh, dating and courtship. I don't like the term courtship, so I'll call up every But well, we'll just talk about dating uh, and seriously dating. How's that? And then uh, what we'll cover Thursday morning is we'll show you uh, The Honeywood Night, chapter 4 of this book, which is a wonderful picture of the hammer used in proper context of God's design, male and female together in a one flesh union. That's where we're heading. Um, in the meantime, if there's any questions you guys doubt, we cover a lot here, but any questions you have will be available. I think probably like most speakers at Munch, yeah, if you were to process something, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I come to you not as an expert, right? I'm not, I'm not here because I've always done it right. I'm here because I bought into the lie for a long time. And thanks be to God, the gospel made me new in Christ. And God has been renewing this area, not only of my life, but and to say, uh, in those I, I get the privilege of hanging up with. So that's my sort of my humble plea to you say, let's, let's journey together to ask some questions and let's see if maybe there's a better way I'm at. All right, cool question. God, she said, let's say that uh, how do you look out? Check there. Or the bottom. Check your marriage. Or like, they you get to Yeah, I, I would say, well, I think you're, if somebody says, to you, hey, how do you feel? I say, wait, I can't it matter how I feel. Uh, what I'd like to tell you is what God's word says. So God's word says, and I would just display God's design. Uh, here, here's a good example of that. We had a uh, guy in our church who transitioned to a gown. And uh, he left the church for a while and then came back as the gown. And uh, he had a conversation with me and said, hey, am I welcome in your church? I said, well, of course you're welcome. I said, well, man, we're all welcome. Well, jacked up people, of course. We got a seat for you. Call. Love you. Glad you're here. Happy for you to hear the word of God. He says, well, can I go to women's Bible study? I said, tell you, you can't. Because I'm connecting here by this church, brother. But thought God created as male and female. Like, this is not a thing in the Bible. And so, no, I'm not going to embrace what's happening here. I'm not going to embrace that. I'm going to love you. But let rejoice is the truth of I'm not gonna I'm not gonna live this fallacy with you. And I used he pronouns to uh, with him, even though he wants to be hurt. And I said, You're welcome to come, but they're, they're gonna be some boundaries that always bring it back to design, always back to the word of God. Your opinion, no offense. Your opinion does that. Who cares what you think? Who cares what I think? What's the Bible say? What's the Bible do? Yeah. Any other questions, thoughts before we wrap up here tonight? Yeah. I have a quick uh, 
I I both of them. I was I I was very really, uh explained uh what oh uh prolonged adolescence as sex. How how are those two connected? I yeah. So so one of the things that happens in manhood is you learn how to take responsibility for yourself, right? By the way, if you're looking for a great definition of manhood, Robert Lewis nailed it years ago. Reject passivity, accept responsibility, lead courageously. The most succinct and best definition of what it means to be a man. Maybe you should try to be that. Maybe you should try to find that. And if you do, uh, bury it. Because if you can find somebody who could do that, uh, that's a person who could walk with God. Prolonged adolescence doesn't take responsibility for themselves or their sexuality. They're indulgent. Prolonged adolescence means I will long to do my laundry because that's what I want. I'm going to play on Xbox because that's what I want. I'm not going to get a job. And I'm not going to be responsible for a relationship. I'm going to continue to push your boundaries until you give me what I want. Because my life right now is all about me. I have a boy. And a boy cannot handle that kind of sexuality the way that honors God. You need to find a man. And a man rejects passivity, accepts responsibility, and leads courageously. So in a relationship, by the way, if you're in a dating relationship and it's getting too physical, that's his fault. That's his fault. Because men, even if she's the one initiating, you've got to be a man. And we'll talk about that. We'll, we'll talk a lot about that. Um, because I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. We just lost our memory. We just loaded into boyhood and called it okay. And it's not okay. Um, and there's a better way. By the way, uh, prolonged adolescence is not satisfying. That's why depression and anxiety are so high. Why prescription meds are so high. That's why suicidality is so high with prolonged adolescence. Because God didn't make you to live. God, we have to be there. <laughs> Preaching over that. Yes. Was it? Reject. 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 Accept responsibility. Lead courageously. By the way, read Genesis 3, the fall. Three, really, what through 15? Uh, you see it right there. Adam goes, uh, he reject, he reject, and he, he goes passive. He's still responds, we wait her. In fact, he says, it's the woman that you gave me. He blames God ultimately, and he doesn't leave alone. Well. So all that deaf history comes out of what Adam did he do, but what Christ, the second Adam, does. So Adam is awful. Jesus, nails it. Nails, not my boo, but your will be done. We he nailed. Yeah. What happened? Was the staff first that they lay it. Right. So CPS didn't take the kids but did a wellness visit to make sure that they were creating a safe environment. And we are still watching we. Yeah, we still have hope. Uh, we're praying for this individual who was caught up in it, you know? So, yeah, pray after that. Anybody else? Got And by the way, I'll keep going until you tell me to stop. So if you've got questions, I'm cool with that, but I know I don't say it, so I need it to you. Yeah. Uh, how would you coach your combat? Like, if you have somebody really close to you that's like lived in something the long time, it's like my dad crashed this plate or anything. Kind of, like, how would you like combat them? Like, yeah, the ramp, I should know a lot. Of so, so take the issue, be said, polygamy. He's got multiple wives. What is one wife, but he has a tons of girl. Oh, okay, got it. So, here's what we do with that issue. And, and then just like take like, sexual issue of deviance and just fill in whatever issue it, you want, right? Masturbation, adultery, pornography, blah, 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 transgender stuff, homosexuality, whatever. What do you do with that? I, I'm asking two very important, well, I'm going first to one question, and that is, is, is he a believer? So, if he's a believer, then you hold him accountable to his Bible. If he's not a believer, then you help him understand that he's in a secular worldview. It is impossible for him to please God without the Spirit. He's not even able to do it. He'll never be able to honor God without the Spirit of God. It's Christ. So I would keep breaking to Christ. Dad, if you're going to blow your life up, you need Jesus, you need Jesus. And just keep lovingly bringing it back to the gospel. But if they know the gospel, that's where it gets a little hard. So fill in the blanks. So my mom uh, says she's a Christian. And so now... I'm learning my Bible six years ago, learning my Bible. I'm like, help me understand how you can say you're a Christian, but actively engage in homosexual life. I mean, Paul's pretty clear that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Help me understand. She says, well, my God wouldn't judge me for how I feel. Do you see it? 
That's expressive individualism. Now, we didn't know what that was back then. They had this name for it. Yep, Truman hadn't read this book yet. My God would judge me. I said, look, you're a God or the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible sure does. But they, they have to explain away the passages. They say, well, it really didn't mean that. Leviticus didn't mean that. Genesis 19 didn't mean that. Uh, first Corinthians 6 didn't mean that. First Timothy didn't mean that. They meant the first uh, Romans 1 didn't mean that. I can have to that's what it means. Is. And interesting, by the way, Romans 1 talks specifically about homosexuality. The only passage in your Bible, there's six for homosexuality. The only passage that talks about lesbianism, which is interesting. Um, and he talks about that which is unnatural. And the argument is, well, no, what's unnatural is to have um, a homosexual relationship with a lot of people. If you're in a monogamous relationship, that's natural. What's Paul's view of natural in Romans? Paul's view of natural is, is Genesis chapter 1. Paul's not dealing with culture. Paul's going all the way back. What's natural is a dude, a man, and a woman having sex on a honeymoon night. That's the action. And so that's what he's pushing on her. So you got to go back to the light. Good. He had it. Well, the journey begins. Yeah, and so we're going we're gonna to poke on a lot of things, by the way. And, and here's the thing that, that happens every time I come. And I've never done this before, but can I just head this off the past? Do you still have a non dating thing? Yeah. Okay, I don't want to talk about your garage. I don't want to talk about, oh, I see this boy, I make sure I get this every year. What should I do about that? Answer it. Absolutely nothing. Because, because there's a contract on your wall that you sign. And so honestly, don't do anything. In fact, learn how to take thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ because you have committed yourself in this program to guard your heart and your mind in Christ. And if you need to pray about that, you pray about that. But I'll be honest, the more you talk about it, the bigger it gets. So just take that little thing and just tuck it into your heart and you be faithful to this program. Because I'll tell you this, I, to, the, to the girls especially, if you are interested in a boy and he's willing to reflect that back to you, he's not the right type of guy. Because if he can't keep his commitment to this program, what makes you think he's gonna keep his commitment to your marriage? or in your dating situation. I mean, think about that logically, right? I mean, if you're both willing to jump the fences and indulge the fantasy of, well, we'll just sneak into the kitchen and talk, and we'll sneak into the classroom and talk, and we'll have this little flirty thing going. If you're willing to do that together, what kind of character do you have? Not the kind that can build a relationship long term. I promise you, it is worth just tuck that thing away. All right, amen? Now, is it okay that I said that? All right. It was, <laughs> because inevitably, every year we start talking about relationships, and people are like, well, I've got this crest on the top. No one can know. I love that topic, not that. Sound good? All right, let me pray for you. Father, I am so thankful that you have given us design. And I'm mindful, Lord, my heart is grieved that the secular view has, has just infiltrated the lives of so many, and that grieves me. But just for what's happening, but for what's happening in people's hearts. There's so much confusion and so much hurt and so much sadness. And Lord, I just, I pray that by your grace, you would open their hearts to see maybe a better way. That life in Christ is better. That life lived at obedience is better. And that God, you are a God who renews our affections make us new in Christ than we are because of Jesus, free from the mastery of the old self. We are free from the slavery that we used, used to be, and we can live in freedom with you. Walking by the Spirit and not gratifying the desires of the flesh, and those who are Christ who have crucified now the flesh with its passions that desires now living by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. And just live out with appropriate expression the design of the hammer of sexuality that you've given to each of us. And we'll thank you, even for the mess, because we know you're with us. We just acknowledge that, and we're grateful. It doesn't matter how bad we've been, you love us, even in the awful. And so, Lord, could we just open to you in that, pray to you, minister to us, give us hope and courage, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, man, Hex Brabbit. Uh, I know, uh, I know you guys are probably a little sleepy, um, but let, let me, let me tell you this, uh, 
what Brad speaks about this week has an unbelievable ability to, to change uh, the trajectory of your relationships for the rest of your life. Uh, truthfully, uh, some of the things that, that Brett said uh, when I was a student, which are going to be the things that he's going to say this week with you, uh, were things that uh, many of them I implemented in my life, uh, and, and many of them I did it because I wanted to go and do whatever I wanted to do. And uh, I, I can tell you that uh, and, uh, this could be incredibly pivotal in the way that you move forward in relationships. Uh, it, it, it it will be pivotal in the way that you follow the Lord. Uh, I talked to some of you guys about decisions, and I, I will look the girls at this as well. As decisions you make now have the ability to create fractures in the foundations of all of your future relationships. And that's why this is important. That's why the way that we talk about sex, the way that we talk about relationships is unbelievably important because God has a good and beautiful plan. He has, and I love what, what Brad just prays up there. He has a perfect plan, a beautiful plan. And it's better than what the world will tell you. Uh, I think one of the things that just happened, I think even as I grew up, is an, uh, an idolatry of sex, an idolatry of relationship, uh, instead of a desire for a personal relationship with Christ. And then everything will spawn out of that, of the way that your relationships spoke so out through your desire for relationship with Christ. So uh, this is a, an immensely important topic. Uh, Jan, I truly am excited for you guys. Uh, no that you'll probably feel a little comfortable at times. Uh, but at the same time, this is important. So uh, I'm excited for you. This is kind of uh, Brad coming and doing Simon Solomon and mentioned it is kind of a, uh, it's a bit of a trippy shit in the offshore. So um, yeah, please ask a lot of questions. Uh, and that's not just to, to Brad, ask questions to each other, uh, appropriate questions uh, in the appropriate circles uh, and ask the staff, ask me, ask Jen, as uh, Tanner and Matt has said, but uh, I could tell you that if you implement the things that uh, are going to be talked about over the course of the next three days, uh, they could radically change the way that you have relationships, the way that you have uh, dating relationships. And uh, if all those words say uh, it's, it's just going to be better for you, uh, if you do. Uh, what happened at Sir if listen for what Brad has said. It is a, a biblically based way of making our relationship. So I blocked for you. I truly, I got pumped because uh, I remember this talk so well uh, as a stew. And now I'm excited to what that was like, So uh, think tomorrow morning, uh, we are back before uh, at what that? Save the pie. Yeah, prep about it. Yes, we uh, the red record phone. Uh, two, three. This is fine. All right. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Make sure you're there. Click the block. Cut out. And uh, the, I will be in for a little bit tomorrow. And then um, am it out, out. But uh, way uh, so thank you for you guys. Hopefully that you guys enjoyed grass tonight. That was awesome. Uh, an Astro Plus, sweet semester Plus, uh, gone virus. So. Hey, I'm Green Knight, and we'll see you tomorrow.